Chapter Twenty of Order Number Eleven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brian Keenan. Order Number Eleven by Caroline Abbott Stanley. Chapter Twenty. Tramp, tramp, tramp. And there was tumult in the air, the fife's shrill note, the drum's loud beat and through the wide land everywhere the answering tread of hurrying feet. The capture of Camp Jackson, with the subsequent firing upon the crowd of spectators, was a bomb that set Missouri ablaze. The state had been invaded. Blood had been shed. Surely the fullness of time had come now. The river counties sprang to arms. Within a week they were hurrying to the capital. From Cooper and Cole, and the kingdom of Calloway, the Independence Greys went down with full ranks, Beverly in the forefront and Ike Swamscott beside him. They carried the cannon captured from the arsenal at Liberty. A cannon was a thing to be proud of. Not every soldier who took up arms in Missouri took up more than the Lord had given him. But they did their best. Hunting rifles were taken down from the antlers, and shotguns and powder horns called into requisition as the flintlock muskets of their revolutionary forefathers had been. It was anything that could shoot. It seemed lucky for once that the Missourians were a bellicose people. Revolvers were commoner with them than with their brethren in the north. Beverly had gone forth buoyantly. It would not be long, he said. And Virginia, believing him, had buckled on his sword with hands that did not tremble and eyes that shone. The two stood together at the horse-blocks just before he went away. He had been down the road toward Mr. Whalen's, to say good-bye, he said. "'Verge,' he said suddenly, stooping to examine his saddle girth, "'why don't you and Sally and the rest of the girls ever go to see Lois Chandler?' "'Lois Chandler?' repeated Virginia, wonderingly. She was thinking of war, not girls. "'Why should we?' "'She's the prettiest girl in the neighborhood.' And she's a nice girl, too, if her father did vote for Abe Lincoln. She is awfully pretty, assented Virginia, who was not without ability to see beauty in another girl. And she's nice enough, too, I suppose. She always seemed so at school. But, brother, you know, she's just not our kind. She says hadn't ought and how and all that. Verge, Beverly's tone was very serious now. If the time ever comes when you could do a kindness to Lois Chandler, I want you to do it. She must be awfully lonely. Did you ever think how cut off she is from everybody? And besides, the girth needed tightening now, a friend of yours thinks a good deal of her. A friend of mine? Virginia's cheeks glowed with a sudden inflow of blood. Well, I'm sure he's welcome to. Who is this friend of mine? He looked at her curiously a moment and then threw back his head with his old-time hilarious laugh. He was going to speak, but just then his father joined them, and the opportunity was passed. Virginia pondered over his words not a little when he was gone. Why should she go to see Lois Chandler? Suppose Gordon did think a good deal of her. Of course it was Gordon. That was nothing to her. He had always liked her when they were in school together, but so had Beverly and the rest of the boys. She was just the kind of a girl that boys always took to, pretty and clinging, and not much sense. Perhaps it was her dependence that appealed to all the masculine hearts, she said to herself, scornfully. Perhaps it wasn't Gordon, after all, that he meant. Then there came to her the recollection of what Gordon had said to her the day she tried to find out if it was Lois he had been walking with. If I or Beverly or any of the boys wanted to tell Lois Chandler goodbye, why shouldn't we? Yes, it was Gordon. It was very lonely when Beverly was gone. So many of the boys were with him. Ike Swamscott and Lee McMurtry and John Pascoe and the two Caldwell boys and, oh, ever so many. And it was not the young men alone. Ben Tallis had stood it till old Virginia went. Then he said he couldn't go again his native state. And there were many just like him. There was a clattering back and forth in Jackson County. 
the recruiting officers scoured the country, and not in vain. The other side was not idle. From Kansas City, Van Horn had gone to St. Louis and obtained permission to organize a battalion. Recruiting had begun in earnest. The blight of war had fallen upon the ragged little town at the mouth of the Caw. Business, except that growing out of military operations, was practically suspended. Gordon had intended settling there when he got his degree, but anybody with half an eye could see now that Kansas City, with its neighbors on the west, was a place to leave if one could get away. A few months before it had been a thriving village of twenty-five hundred. By May it had shrunk to half that size. On Grand Prairie they were bracing themselves for a shock. Mr. Caldwell had taken his negroes and his mules and gone to Texas. Jackson County was too close to the border for safety, he said. Tigerman, having little else in the way of personal property, had packed up his wife and children and gone. Nobody knew where. Perhaps he also noticed that Jackson was pretty close to the border. "'Judge Saunders has taken his negroes down to Arrow Rock,' said Colonel Trevilian to his wife one day. He had just come from Independence. "'He has. Do you think there's any danger?' she asked anxiously. "'Not with ours,' he said confidently. "'I have no fears whatever of our negroes leaving us. Why should they? They have always been treated well, and they have sense enough to know it.' "'I don't know, Father,' Virginia said looking up from the gown yoke she was embroidering. Liz says Jake told her they would all have a farm if they went to Kansas, and wouldn't have to work any more. It has evidently been talked over. "'My dear,' returned her father, with some irritation, "'you ought not to encourage Liz to talk about such things. It is preposterous.' "'I don't encourage her, father. I told her it was ridiculous. I don't know where Jake got it from.' "'Old man Chandler, probably,' remarked Miss Nanny, with acerbity. Gordon came home in June, but not to locate in Kansas City. He had held himself until his diploma was earned, but his heart was keeping step to the drumbeat of the nation. Paul's message had come to him. I speak unto you, young men, because you are strong. What better use for his strength than to defend his nation's flag? I knew you would go, his mother sighed. I have been nerving myself to meet it. Oh, yes, I know it is right, dear child, but I am afraid I am not made of such stuff as the Spartan mothers. But Dr. Lay grasped his hand as man to man, and Gordon felt his heart thrill with a new determination and strength. Go, my son, go. Our country needs her bravest now. Gordon went over to Keswick the next day. There had not been much communication between the families during the last few weeks, and Sally was down in Cass on a visit. Beverly was gone, they knew that much. And so did he, for Sally had written him how handsome he and Ike Swamscott looked in their new uniforms. Most of the troops were ununiformed, but the Greys were an exceptional company. He did not tell them where he was going, nor ask any of them to go with him. So many things had happened since he had seen them last. So many things were likely to happen now. And he felt himself growing hot and cold as he thought of the differences between them. Carefully put away, not for love of it, but for love of the fingers that made it, was the little rebel flag that she had sent him. How often he had thought of the message that came with it. This is the flag that the friends of Virginia fight for. What would she think of his enlisting to fight against it? But he knew perfectly well that, whatever she thought of it, he should do it. He had fought that battle first of all, and come off victor, though a little faint and spent, perhaps. He gave his bridle and a coin to the grinning negro who came shambling out from the rear. "'Howdy, Mars Gordon. Thank you, sir. How does your corporosity seem to sagitate, sir?' "'All right, Jake.' My corporosity is in prime condition. You haven't forgotten how to talk dictionary, I see, since I've been away. How are you? Mighty poorly, bless the Lord, sir. No well-bred negro ever owned up to being anything more than poorly or tolerable at most. 
"'You don't look it,' said Gordon, giving the sleek face and well-fed body a critical glance. "'You are Possuman. How's Caroline?' "'Caroline's just tolerable, sir. She's got a misery in her chest, Caroline is. Mars Gordon looks like you favors your pa mo and mo all de time. You just a very spit of him. Yes, yeah, sir, dat you is.' "'Are the ladies at home, Jake?' Gordon's heart was beating so that he was glad of the negro's loquacity. It gave him time to steady himself. "'Yes, yeah, sir, they all in de house, excusin' of Miss Virginia. She done gone to Independence to make a visit. Just walk in, Mars Gordon. They done hear de pronouncement that you'd come from y'all's Bentley, was comin' over here sparkin' dat triflin' no-count Liz. I reckon they's contemplatin' your rival, sir.' They received him exactly as they would have done a year ago. They talked of his journey home, his school, his commencement, Virginia's absence and the disappointment she would feel at not seeing him, everything but Beverly and the war. People grew very skillful in those days at threading the passages of conversation without running into shoal water. At last Gordon asked pointedly about Beverly. "'He is in Jefferson City,' Mrs. Trevilian said, with a little tremble of the chin. We couldn't keep him, Gordon. Some of us didn't want to keep him, Miss Nanny said, with flashing eyes. I gloried in his spirit. Mrs. Trevilian talked straight on. Gordon's heart sank. In many ways Virginia was like Miss Nanny. She was intense and sometimes imperious. And yet she was like her sweet mother, too, who was always reasonable. This was the undercurrent that was running in his mind while Mrs. Trevilian talked. She told him all about Beverly and the message she had left. Miss Nanny had been called away, and they talked more freely without her. He said he knew you would be for the Union, Gordon, but that that should never come between you. And Gordon felt a sudden rush of feeling to heart and eyes. He rose to go at last, and Mrs. Trevilian went with him out upon the pillared portico. Keswick had never looked more beautiful. A queen of the prairie was trained around one column, and a Baltimore bell, with its full-set clusters and the fragrance one never forgets, was on the other. At the parlor window was a sweet briar. He and Virginia had found it in the woods one day and planted it there. They were all doing their bravest. It was a time for nature to help, and Missouri roses are riotous in June. They stood in silence. Not a word had been said about his plans. He looked out now over the scene before him with a sudden prophetic anguish of spirit. How peaceful it was! How beautiful! What would it be when he saw it again? On the left was the summer house. How often he and she had sat there together! Would they ever again? When he turned to Mrs. Trevilian, his eyes were dim. He took her hand and raised it to his lips. It has been like home to me, he said, and I may not see it again. Her hand closed over his. You are going, she said, rather than asked. I am going. I can't expect you to say Godspeed, Mrs. Trevilian, but give me your blessing. She took him in her arms. He was almost like her own son to her. God keep you, my child. I pray him that you two may never meet in battle. Heaven grant it. But if we do, I do not need to tell you, Mrs. Trevilian, that this arm will never be raised against him. I believe it, Gordon, she said. It comforted him afterward to remember her faith. And this was the sweet memory of Keswick he took with him. End of chapter 20 Recording by Brian Keenan Chapter 21 of Order Number 11 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon Order Number 11 By Carolyn Abbott Stanley Chapter 21 Oh, Sister Phoebe. They were having a party at Mr. Delano's in Independence the next night. 
thank god it is never all shadow anywhere or anywhen in this world they were in full tide of what the scoffing called presbyterian dancing mr delano was an elder and of course could not be expected to countenance worldly amusements dancing he believed to be a device of the evil one in fact he knew it his mind never experienced one fleeting doubt on this subject his principles were ultramarine and his practice well the young people in his house always stood in a ring instead of a parallelogram the girls sandwiched between the boys and then joined hands and circled to the left to the music of their own young voices in the pious delusion that it was not a dance but a play good mr delano looking on with approval and thanking god that these dear lambs were not as other lambs not even as the poor ungodly episcopalians who fiddled openly and danced on the square it was o oh, sister phoebe they were playing the game that stands in all hearts of that day for youthful effervescence and the joy of life it was another missouri compromise it has limbered the joints and satisfied the cravings of whole generations of youthful sinners longing to dance and daring not even mr mctavish could see no harm in o oh, sister phoebe though his more acrid spouse after watching it once said that for her part she couldn't see much difference between professors and worldlians one seemed about as limber jointed as the other but the majority took mr mctavish's view and the presbyterian youngsters got their share after all for nature is rarely cheated they were singing it gaily tonight with a soft swish of skirts and the tread of slippered feet oh sister phoebe how merry were we when we sat under the juniper tree the juniper tree e hi o hi o the juniper tree e hi o thus far it was always clear sailing and everybody felt and looked natural but in the next quatrain a choice was imminent and those having any reasonable hope of being selected by the lone occupant of the ring looked away in rosy self-consciousness or cast coquettish glances as the case might be and now it was rise you up johnny and choose the one choose you the fairest or else choose none or else choose none i o i o or else choose none i o all this was preliminary of course for with the maiden of his choice seated demurely beside him johnny or tommy or jimmy or whoever the happy youth might be had a cap in his hand with which to crown the captured lady for his guerdon he was to but the song itself tells it take this cap on your head keep your head warm take a sweet kiss and twill do you no harm twill do you no harm hi o hi o twill do you no harm hi o and probably it never did none of us can remember the damage anyway though we have no difficulty in recalling the bliss from time to time couples slipped out of the ring and promenaded up and down the piazza which seemed built on purpose running as it did the length of two generous missouri rooms and the hall then there was the summer-house in the yard whose moonlighted doorway and shadowy nooks stood invitingly near of course a place of any pretensions always had a summer-house virginia trevelyan was radiant that night in a dotted white swiss with blue shired ribbons defining her snowy arms and neck and a queen of the prairie rose in her hair john delano had asked her if it were named for her it might have been considering her stateliness the bloom on her cheek and her prairie home somehow nobody ever thought of virginia as a country girl she was simply from jackson or the prairie she was talking animated to young tevis when she heard her name pronounced behind her in a stage whisper by uncle joe 
the negro man who waited on the door she excused herself and stepped into the hall what is it uncle joe dey some young man waitin for you outside miss virginia num he say he won't come in he's waitin down dar by de white honeysuckle who is it you know Nome, i don't know him looks to me like he's one of dese here federals oh no uncle joe she laughed there's no federal that wants me or would get me if he did she ran lightly down the walk to the honeysuckle which covered a flaring fan-shaped frame out in the yard a tall man stood in its shadow she cast a half-scared glance toward the house as she saw the uniform of a soldier did you wish to see me she asked with head erect i am miss trevelyan the visor of the man's fatigue cap threw his face into shadow virginia why gordon lay she put her hands impulsively in his and then drew back what are you doing in those clothes his heart sank he had not seen her since september before her welcome even was her disapprobation made manifest when did you get home from kentucky the day after you went away your mother said did you go to see mother no i went to see you but you were gone then i came on here i couldn't go without seeing you virginia she dropped into a seat that stood at the foot of the honeysuckle and he sat down beside her they were enveloped by its cloying sweet the fragrance associated itself forever afterward with that hour gordon are you really really going his soldier dress had told the news i am going i have come to say good-bye but gordon why do you go i know you don't feel as we do but why must you go to fight your own people for they are your own people because i am needed he said simply did you know beverly had gone yes suppose you two should meet on the battlefield have you thought of it i have thought of it many many times virginia but he did what he thought was right and i must do the same do you blame me for it no it isn't that but oh gordon it is so dreadful will you be where they will fire cannon and bombs and all those things that you can't dodge as you could a little bullet i shall go wherever they send me he said a soldier cannot choose when did you enlist yesterday the moonlight made the place like day except for the shadow of the honeysuckle did mother see you in those clothes no but i don't believe it would have made any difference with her if she had he was thinking of her parting blessing gordon stand up he stood before her in the full strength of his young manhood his uniform accentuated his height she shivered and turned her head with a little gasp you are so tall they would be sure to aim for you the promenaders went back and forth on the piazza black coats and figures in voluminous skirts and rainbow tints with gleaming bare arms flitted past the french windows the soft tramp of that endless circle came to them plainly there was a burst of gay laughter now and then and the song went on afresh oh sister phoebe how merry were we virginia drew her breath almost in a sob it was always in the past how merry were we how merry were we it seemed to her that it would never be are we again there was a tightening in her throat and a constriction about her heart what good times they had had all their lives but it was over now with beverly in one army and gordon in the other oh it was too dreadful 
and that wretched senseless music when we sat under the juniper tree the juniper tree e hi o hi o the juniper she recalled how they used to wonder what the juniper tree was and why sister phoebe had chosen that and who sister phoebe was anyway but if the juniper tree was not in her catalogue of remembered umbrage almost everything else was everything certainly that grew in jackson county and gordon was with her under them all there were the apple trees they used to rifle in the spring and the haw bushes and the crab apple down in the pasture whose blossoms gordon had told her shyly one day were just the color of her cheek she had always remembered that for that was the day she first found out oh well and there were the locust trees in dr lay's yard under which they had all sat and played authors steeping themselves in perfumed bliss and carefree indolence while the bees went back and forth gathering honey for future needs and looking down in buzzing superiority upon the lazy mortals never guessing that they too were gathering sweets for wintry days and there were the red buds and dogwood that the boys had scorned to have called trees at all and the giants of the forest that they climbed for grapes and the hickories and black walnuts of their youthful hunts when they did not mind stained hands for the joy that was set before them of luscious nuts and winter nights and scott's novels and the big honey locust under which they found the thorns to use as stilettos for the gown yokes the girls were always embroidering even the sapling spoke of him for one of her earliest recollections was of the boys holding down the slender trees for herself and sally to mount and ride gordon always showed her exactly where to sit and let her up gently while beverly misled the trusting sally and went into convulsions of laughter on the ground as she shot shrieking into the air oh the good times they had had under the trees and gordon was in them all how merry were we how merry were we verge he dropped into the old name unconsciously suppose i shouldn't come back would you care care it seemed to the girl with a cannon-ball before her eyes that she would never care for anything else there was little coquetry about virginia trevelyan and there was no time for it had there been they were facing tremendous issues and they knew it oh gordon she said her heart in her eyes and he took her to his arms it was a poor wooing but when two hearts have opened side by side from nascent bud to perfect flower there is small need of words virginia if i come back if she clung to him he would come back he would he would surely the cannon-ball would pass him by it must strike somebody of course but not him oh god not him it was thus we pray with inarticulate moans it is thus we believe in our helplessness and in our love some other one not ours we say forgetting in our anguish that he too that other one is somebody's stay somebody's best beloved if i come back he whispered when you come back she said her form erect her head thrown back with shining eyes and lips that tried hard not to quiver when you come back she would not say if and so they were betrothed virginia he said after a while i was half afraid to come to you in my uniform i thought you might scorn me perhaps because i had it on and yet i wore it purposely she looked up at him proudly why should i scorn you for offering your life for the cause you think right if feeling as you do you had stayed at home rather than risk losing me 
then i should have scorned you i can forgive a courageous act even when it is against my side but a base one never dearest i think one could hardly do a base thing with love of you in his heart virginia remembered those words long afterward and tried to believe they were true but oh gordon she cried later i do wish you were in the other army i won't know now which side to pray for pray that the right may win he said gravely End of chapter 21 Recording by John Brandon Chapter 22 of Order Number 11 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon Order Number 11 by Carolyn Abbott Stanley Chapter 22 border warfare begins one september morning three months after that farewell under the honeysuckle james h lane with his kansas troops crossed the border into missouri two weeks later that body of cavalry in their beautiful suits of blue rode proudly back into kansas city the flag at their head the flag men were dying for elsewhere and in their rear the spoils of war they had struck a blow for the union the little town of osceola was in ashes a score of her citizens who had dared resist the looting of their homes lay dead or dying the contents of the wagons told the rest everything disloyal said general lane must be cleaned out and remarks his biographer never were orders more literally or cheerfully obeyed indeed if we may believe the record the disloyalty most feared by this worthy brigade was that which lurked in feather beds and silver plate they must rid the land of that first and foremost what do you think of this sir demanded colonel trevelyan of dr lay when the news of that raid reached grand prairie it is damnable sir damnable mrs lay started in all her life she had never heard her husband come so near swearing the doctor's indignation was so deep and his chagrin so evident that colonel trevelyan really said less than he had intended to say he could not help remarking however that he understood lane's own particular share of the spoils to have been a fine carriage it is true sir returned the doctor i have it from good authority i hunted that story down when i was in kansas city yesterday that man sir is a disgrace to the flag he follows he wrote a letter that night to governor robinson of kansas whom he had met several times at the gillis house protesting in the name of the union men of the border against such outrages they will force men into the confederate army they have already done so to this letter governor robinson replied that weeks ago he had written general fremont commander of the western department urging that lane's brigade be removed from the border i have told him he wrote that what we have to fear and do fear is that lane's brigade will get up a war by going over the line committing depredations and then returning to our state dr lay took this letter over to mr whalen and after some consultation they decided to write a letter of protest from jackson county themselves the letter was barely gone when still more alarming intelligence reached them osceola was several counties removed the new danger was near at hand at that time there were no railroads in western missouri and the transportation of supplies became a question of some importance about two hundred prairie schooners and five or six hundred oxen were collected at kansas city to be sent to jefferson city and rolla as terminal points general lane's 
kansas troops were to escort them if the people along the route had heard that the escort was to be the devil's own they would not have felt more consternation they were wild with fear anything would be better than to risk such a visitation without realizing that they were promising what they could by no possibility be sure of fulfilling some misguided ones pledged the government authorities that if only the escort were not sent the train should be unmolested the wagons started in two sections twenty-four hours apart they camped in neighboring towns and in one ill-fated night were set upon the wagons burned and the cattle stampeded it was probably the initial work of quantrell's guerrillas but the penalty fell upon the innocent not the guilty it was made the pretext for jennison's first raid jennison the scourge of the border the man who fought with lasso and torch the scavenger whose grappling hook took hold of all that was worth having and never let go from that day the people of the hapless section ate the bread of adversity and drank the water of affliction a nation has come up upon my land lamented the hebrew prophet strong and without number whose teeth are the teeth of a lion and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion he hath laid my vine waste and barked my fig trees a fire devoureth before them and behind them a flame burneth the land is as the garden of eden before them and behind them a desolate wilderness he might have said it of the border the sabbath that followed will not be forgotten by this generation nor the next in that vicinity it is called jennison's day yet the prophet joel certainly had that devoted land in mind tell your children of it he says and let your children tell their children and their children another generation that which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten and that which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten and that which the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten the pious palmers came in lane's footpad brigade a swarm of locusts lighted when jennison and his jayhawkers swept down upon the land the noisome cankerworm with mandibles multiplied crept after them in the red legs when they got through there was nothing left for the caterpillar grand prairie's day came later through that fall and winter they waited and trembled a counter force was gathering in the woods around them seven or eight desperate men had met on little blue and chosen a leader that leader was quantrell a name rivaling jennison's for grim work from the first and surpassing it when the last stroke fell they were not all outlaws in the beginning most of them went in with a wound that rankled some of them had seen the accumulation of a lifetime go up in smoke while their families were thrust out upon the pitiless prairies others had followed bloodied stock to the kansas border and gone back to take up their guns one had seen a father's gray hairs dabbled in blood another mourned a son many there were who went because they could not stay in safety at home every raid of jennison sent recruits to quantrell it was safer to be in the brush than at home and they would have revenge at any rate the clans were gathering all along the sny the stream abounding in fastnesses and skirted by almost inaccessible precipices it was a good spot for a lurking foe it is historic yet the hold-ups which have given rise to the worn joke gentlemen we are now entering missouri secrete your valuables have many of them had their origins in this very cracker neck and some of the men who planned them are survivors of that band on grand prairie they held their breath 
they knew that when the shock came it would be terrific and they were in the storm center beverly was with price in southwest missouri making bullets from granby lead and improvising cartridges he was a lieutenant now and had sewed a bit of red flannel on his shoulder to show it straps not being at hand he and gordon had fought against each other at lexington but neither knew it gordon was shut up with beleaguered mulligan and beverly fought behind the hemp breastworks that won the day ike swamscott stood beside him they were all busy sewing one day at caswick in the early spring of eighteen sixty two mrs trevelyan was finishing off a zouave jacket for virginia made from one of her father's black broadcloth coats turned it was to go with a garibaldi waist of magenta delaine which had once been white but was now the fashionable war color by virtue of a bath in cudbear cudbear was an aniline dye which had the double merit of being bright and cheap everything was colored with cudbear during the war from bonnet ribbons to carpet rags there are some persons who have an unconquerable aversion to cerise and all kindred shades they are usually persons with good memories the color brings up the instant suspicion no matter how fine the article that it has been dyed the garibaldi waist and the zouave jacket were a part of virginia's outfit for a visit to Magdaleno. it was to be worn with a black silk skirt of miss nanny's flounced to the waist virginia was trying on a pair of side-laced draped at tay gaiters that uncle reuben had just sold for her she had got the pattern from liddy merriweather and it had gone all over the neighborhood dry goods and shoes were getting frightfully dear but one couldn't go barefoot people hardly knew how they would have got along without the providential rise of that fashion in gaiters sometimes they were made of scraps of cloth but draped to tay was the approved material somehow the foreign name took off the homemade curse it is all ready to put on said mrs trevelyan looking at the jacket admiringly what do you think of it nan it is very pretty indeed returned miss nanny especially to have been made out of rags and gumption there was a loud knock at the front door just then and mrs trevelyan opened it two armed soldiers stood outside madam said one respectfully we are belated and would like to stay all night if we can certainly said mrs trevelyan no belated traveller had ever been turned from that door no matter what was the colour of his coat if he had been a friend and a virginian instead of a foe and a kansan he could not have received more courteous treatment he and his companion were entertained until bedtime and then put into the guest chamber being invited in the meantime to remain to family prayers at breakfast they were served with hot waffles which they liked being rather surfeited with hardtack when they were starting away the leader beckoned mrs trevelyan into the hall madam he said you have treated me as a gentleman i will prove to you that i am one jennison is coming through here tomorrow if you have anything of value hide it and lie like the devil end of chapter 22 recording by john brandon chapter 23 of order number 11 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by brian keenan order number 11 by caroline abbott stanley chapter 23 a day of sewing the warning threw them into the utmost consternation what should they hide where would they hide it messengers were dispatched to different places to give the alarm 
to Mr. Swamscott's, Mr. Pascoe's, Miss Martha Robnett's, all of whom had sons or brothers in the Southern Army, and to a number of others who had taken no part in the war, but were known to be Southern sympathizers. Virginia got on Rob Roy and rode over to Dr. Lay's. There was not much probability of the Jayhawkers molesting them, Colonel Trevilian thought, but it would do no harm to put them on their guard. Miss Nanny herself went over to Miss Tiny's. There was never any telling how they would take things, she said. Their attitude verified the assertion. Miss Tiny, who was the leading spirit, simply stood up in the middle of the floor and declared that they would not turn over a hand. When her position was defined, Miss Tony supported it. Were they receivers of stolen goods, she demanded, that they must put things into hiding? Certainly not. If these cutthroats and thieves chose to rob and kill, let them do it. If they had to be overrun by an abolitionized North, life was not worth much anyway. No, she should hide nothing. But, Miss Tiny, urged Miss Nanny, they probably won't kill you, and they will take your silver. You don't want to eat with pewter spoons just because we are in the hands of the abolitionized North, do you? I shall hide nothing, said Miss Tiny, firmly. It would be undignified and unworthy a Virginian to concede in such a manner any possible control they might have over my property. I hope I am not so lost to what, to what. She never finished it. She was accustomed to ask herself in any unexpected emergency, what would they do in my native state? Or to say promptly in any known case, they never do so in Virginia. Today the props were all knocked from under her. She was without precedent. Miss Tiny, Miss Nanny said, desperately, if you won't do that, there is only one other thing to do. Brother William says to tell you, you must put yourself under the protection of your brother in the Federal Army. He says to show them the letter you received from your brother Jeems, telling of his determination to stand by the Union, and tell them that if they harm you in any way, they will have to answer for it to a United States officer. He thinks that even the Jayhawkers will not dare to molest the sisters of General Bascom. At the beginning of this message, Miss Tony had glanced with startled apprehension at her sister. That name had never been spoken, even between themselves, since the day the letter came. But a surging hope rose in her heart. This would be such a reasonable way of escape from the danger that threatened them. She waited, breathless, for her sister's reply. Miss Tiny did not falter. She was as white as she would be when she was dead, but the hard lines around the mouth did not soften. She looked straight into the eyes of her visitor. We have no brother, she said. Miss Tony fell back in her chair, and Miss Nanny went home in a rage. They deserve to lose everything they have, she told her brother. At Dr. Lay's, Virginia heard news that put the Jayhawkers out of her mind. Gordon had been ordered south. He was coming down the next night to say goodbye. What had taken place under the honeysuckle was a sweet secret between these two. They had never confided it to a soul. Engagements were not made public then as now. But Mrs. Lay put her arms tenderly around Virginia when she went away and drew her to her heart. Perhaps she guessed. There was a scurrying around on Grand Prairie that day. At Keswick they hid the silver and the little money they still had, and Colonel Trevilian's best suit, and Beverly's that he had left. It did not occur to them to hide women's clothing, which was unfortunate. Over the parlor was a dark garret, entered from the hall bedroom. Such valuables as they could collect were thrust in here, the door was papered over, a bed put up against it, and they felt reasonably secure. There was not much sleep at Keswick that night, nor elsewhere on Grand Prairie. In the morning the Philistines were upon them. The Trevilians really had very little idea what they were to expect, but they supposed, in the simplicity of their souls, that this was an army on its way somewhere and that Jennison would be at its head. As they watched the soldiers coming up the road, their bayonets glittering in the morning sun, they were surprised to see how few there were, only eight. This must be just the advance guard, said Miss Nanny. But in a moment some government wagons rolled into view, empty ones, as they found out later, 
and no more soldiers appeared. "'Can that be Jennison?' asked Miss Nanny, as she and her niece peered through the Venetian blinds. "'The one at the head, I mean. Why, haven't I seen that man somewhere?' Virginia was thinking, with a sudden sinking of her heart, that she had seen the one behind him. They had no time, however, for further investigation, for the squad had now passed beyond the range of their vision. "'Aunt Nan,' said Virginia, "'I believe in my soul that is—' The sentence was unfinished, for at that moment there was a resounding, imperious knock at the door with the butt-end of a rifle. Colonel Trevilian went to the door and the three women crowded around him. Thus, when the door was opened, it happened that the whole family confronted Mr. Tigerman. And what could be worse to confront in such a moment than a small vindictive soul, nursing a fancied grievance, and clothed with a little brief authority? "'Good morning, Tigerman,' said the Colonel, as though he had met him yesterday. The man swelled up like a frog. His day had come now. "'Lieutenant Tigerman, if you please, when you speak to me,' he said brusquely. "'Ah, Lieutenant Tigerman, and what can I do for you, sir?' "'I want your arms, and that pretty quick.' He ignored the ladies with fine disdain, remembering a time when one of them had ignored him. "'Come, I don't want any of your palaver.' "'We have no arms,' said Colonel Trevilian. "'They were all taken from us at the beginning of the war by Colonel Jennison's orders, as you must know.' Virginia had been scanning the faces behind the lieutenant. There were but six of them. The one she was looking for was not there. Tigerman pushed past the group in the hall and strode into Mrs. Trevilian's room on the left. How often he had longed to enter that house and hold familiar converse with its inmates. Well, the time had come at last. "'Unlock that drawer,' he commanded, pointing to a mahogany bureau. And don't give me any more of your damned impertinence." There were seven armed men against him, and Colonel Trevilian unlocked the drawer. While Tigerman was going through the bureau, and a soldier standing guard, the other men were scattering through the house. When this raid into Jackson County was planned, Tigerman had boasted with an oath that he would gut Keswick. The rest might go where they pleased, but he would have that for his share and he had called for volunteers to assist. The men understood their privileges and availed themselves of them. Finding that it was plunder and not blood they were after, Colonel Trevilian left them and hurried down to his stables, and the three helpless women stood by and watched the ravaging of their home. Upon the pretext of looking for concealed weapons, wardrobes were rummaged and drawers ransacked. Trunks were emptied on the floor to make room for such things as they wanted to carry away. Silk dresses, furs, jewelry, table linen, all was grist that came to their mill. Two of the men spying around went into the hall bedroom. "'Seems to me that's a queer place for a bed,' said one, looking around with a practiced eye. They whirled it aside, and the patch of new paper told its story. They did not even have the trouble of hunting up the Trevilian valuables. They were collected ready for them. Miss Nanny stood by, speechless with rage. When they took her pearls, her beautiful necklace and brooch and pendant earrings that were to be Virginia's on her wedding day, her voice returned. "'You are brave soldiers,' she cried, maddened past all sense of fear. "'Is this the way you fight your country's battles?' Filching jewelry from bureau drawers? The man laughed lightly. You are a rebel, aren't you? Yes, I'm a rebel, to the backbone. If I had ever been Union, I wouldn't own it now. Nan! But Miss Nanny was past stopping, even by that soft voice. Well, I guess we have a right to confiscate rebel goods, said the man, holding up an ashes of roses silk and then laying it in the trunk. "'Do you know what Florence Nightingale said?' demanded Miss Nanny. "'I believe I haven't the honor of Florence's acquaintance. What did she say?' "'She said, "'Governments confiscate. Soldiers steal.' Mrs. Trevilian caught her by the arm and shook her. "'Nan, these men will shoot you.' "'Sister Betty, I don't care if they do. I will say what I think of it. It's infamous.' 
Go ahead, said the man, good-humoredly. It does you good, and it don't hurt us. In another room, Virginia was pleading for her joie jacket and dry de tea gaiters. It was no use. Ahab coveted the garden, even to the snowdrops and the lilies of the valley. The government wagons were driven close to the door. Into them went household goods of every description. Beds, mattresses, furniture, silk quilts, rose blankets, even heirlooms and family portraits. Mrs. Trevilian begged for the portraits, but Lieutenant Tigerman had a taste for the beautiful, if not for the good and the true, and family portraits are scarce in a new country. Colonel Trevilian's best suit had been thrust hastily into Logan's box, in the hope that the Negro's belongings would not be searched. Vain hope! A tall soldier drew them out with gloating eyes. "'For de Lord's sake, master,' said the Negro, "'don't take my breeches. Dem's de ones are going to be married in.' The man took a look at the long legs in his grasp, and then at the squat figure of the darky. "'You're lying,' he said. By the length of them, they belong to that long-legged old rebel in the house. Virginia kept close to her father that day. She soon left the house to her mother and Miss Nanny. Locking her arm in his, she went with him as he tried to save his stock. While the others were at work in the house the day before, he had been busy outside. Rex, his blooded bull, had been taken down into the brush and corralled. The more valuable animals of other kinds were disposed of in like manner. They might have saved themselves the trouble. When the men came they called for Rex by name. His fame had gone abroad, and they had come for him. It was when they were getting Rex that Virginia came face to face with Emmons Baird. He half spoke, being taken at a disadvantage, for he had not expected to see her here. She only looked him over with scornful eyes. It was he that she had seen then. She thought so. Her look angered him, as her words had once before. "'I've come back,' he said insolently, "'to keep company with you.' "'I see,' she said quietly. "'You went away like a thief in the night, "'and you've come back like a thief in the daytime. "'I suppose you can't help it.' Colonel Trevilian stood by, as many another man on Grand Prairie did that day, utterly powerless, as his choice herd was driven off. He would not beg. It would have done no good if he had. They needed stock. Of all the people on that place, and all the things they had set out to do, only Mammy was successful in holding her position. She had undertaken to save the meat. They had fed soldiers before, and Mammy was tired of it. Moreover, there was the constant fear that the meat might some day be carted off. She set her wits to work to devise a plan whereby this might be prevented, and Mammy's wits were not to be despised. Somehow and somewhere she had got hold of a spoiled ham. She kept it in a box, ready for the emergency. That day one of Lieutenant Tigerman's soldiers came to the kitchen door and ordered dinner for twelve men. Of course, teamsters have to be fed as well as men that bear arms for their country. Mammy had seen the lieutenant looking into the smokehouse, and she recognized the fact that the emergency had come. She drew forth the ham and a turkey wing, talking volubly as she did so to prevent the man's getting away. She made savage passes at the meat, but did not cut into it. "'Hurry up, old woman. We can't stay here all day.' Mammy flirted the wing, higher and higher. "'Yes, yeah, sir, Mars Colonel. I's hurrying all I kin. I just brushin' de skippers off to see em meat. They awful si vigorous skippers is, but I'll get em out directly. Look here, Mars Colonel.' The man came close and surveyed the meat. "'Ugh! Throw that to the hogs. Haven't you got anything else?' "'Nothing but middlin,' said Mammy, regretfully. "'We all got some monstrous good fat middlin. "'Look like de skippers don't care so much for de side meat.' "'Neither do we. "'Uncle Sam gives us enough sow-belly. "'Haven't you got any chickens?' "'Nary a chicken,' said Mammy, "'glancing down toward the pasture as she spoke, "'in mortal terror lest the recreant fowls "'that she had been at pains to tie in a thicket "'should have escaped, 
and taken this inopportune time for a stroll. Just then, Lieutenant Tigerman came around the house. I don't know, but we better go on to the next place for dinner, Lieutenant. Look at this meat. Lieutenant Tigerman took one look, and then stepped to the smokehouse door. A goodly array of hams hung from the joists. Are they all like that? he asked. He was intending to fill in vacant spots with hams. Yes, yeah, sir, dis just a fair sample, I reckon, said Mammy, respectfully. We all had monstrous bad luck with the meat dis year. It is likely that if Colonel Trevilian had heard her, he would have upset the whole successful venture. He would rather have lost his hams than his reputation for curing them. That is, he would in sixty-two. The men turned away. Lieutenant Tigerman spoke a word to the soldier ready with the ladder, and Mammy put the ham back in the box with a chuckle. "'You done mighty well that time, old sow-leg. I go and try you and the skippers again.' And she did. When that cavalcade crossed the boundary between the two states, it looked like the train of some barbaric conqueror. All it lacked was the captives in chains. It stretched out miles and miles in length, herds of cattle, flocks of sheep, droves of swine. Blooded stock was rare in Kansas then. Many a man got his start that day. Behind them was despair. The next day Lieutenant Tigerman drove a government wagon into his private yard in the outskirts of Lawrence. Mrs. Tigerman came out to assist in the unloading. "'My land,' she said admiringly, "'ain't that a mattress worth having?' There must be forty pounds of hair in it. Mrs. Tigerman had usually lain on shucks. I bet they hated to see that go. Mr. Tigerman set down his end of a heavy pier glass that had been the pride of Keswick and the country round. As he looked at it now, even he had his doubts about its feeling at home on his wife's rag carpet. But then, there might be other trips and other carpets. He took off his coat, his beautiful coat of blue, with the lieutenant's straps, and wiped his brow. "'I tell you,' he said firmly, "'this union's got to be preserved, no matter what it costs. There ain't any sacrifices we can make that is too great.' "'That there ain't,' asseverated his wife, fervently, shaking out the folds of Miss Nanny Trevilian's lavender silk. "'I'm nothing but a poor, weak woman, and it ain't much I can do.' But I'm going to stand by the government to the last. Did you get any spoons? End of chapter 23 Recording by Brian Keenan Chapter 24 of Order Number 11 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brian Keenan. Order number 11 by Caroline Abbott Stanley. Chapter 24. Trifles Light as Air. Reprisals came. That train was hardly out of the state before Mr. Westover, a Union man, was called out by Quantrell's men and shot on his own threshold. Mr. Whalen had his staple burned. Dr. Lay's last horse was taken, a calamity for a doctor. And so it went. When Gordon came down the next night, he found a household filled with apprehension for his safety and their own. They ate supper with locked doors and drawn shades. It was late when he got over to Keswick. Virginia had been to the front door a dozen times, listening for hoofbeats. At last they came, and, catching up a shawl, she sped down the walk into the night. She was waiting for him at the gate. Gordon, she whispered. It might not be he, and even if it were, there was no telling these days who would be skulking around. Virginia! It was the first time he had seen her since that night under the honeysuckle, and on that meeting nobody shall intrude. As they started up the walk, the door opened, and a shaft of light fell upon them. Virginia drew Gordon hastily into the shadow. Then the light was obscured, and Miss Nanny stood in the doorway. By the time they got to the porch, they were all there to greet him, and he was taken into the family room. If Gordon had had any haunting doubts about his reception, 
they were cast to the winds now. He almost wished, as the evening flew by, that they were not so fond of him, for he had not a word with Virginia alone. There was so much to talk about, the Tigerman raid, and all the exciting times of the last eight months, that it almost seemed as if the evening was gone before it was begun. As he left Virginia at the steps, Gordon whispered, in a voice inaudible to the rest, "'Tomorrow we'll go down to the grapevine tree. I've got to see you.' Then he was gone. The next morning, as Gordon was taking a morning nap, he heard his father's voice calling him. He sprang up. There was a note of alarm in that voice. "'Gordon, did you fasten the stable door last night?' "'Yes, sir. Why?' "'Your horse is gone.' "'My horse,' echoed Gordon, in consternation. "'Gone?' He was throwing on his clothes and going down the steps as he spoke. "'It's gone. When Wash went down this morning to take care of him, the door was open and the horse gone. It must have been taken, I think, though I thought it was just possible that you had not fastened the door and he might have got loose and started home.' I am in hopes that is the way it was, said Gordon. Still, I am sure I fastened the door. He might possibly have worked it loose. If it was a Kansas City horse, it would go straight home. It was a Kansas City horse. Damon was lame, and I had to get another one. It is rather lucky he was. By Jove, he said, shaking his head, as he took in the bearings of the case upon his safety. I'd hate to think he was stolen. Was the saddle gone? I don't know, returned the doctor. Wash has just come in. I didn't think to ask. They went down to the stable themselves. There were fresh tracks around the lot, and the saddle was gone. That made it certain. Well, said Gordon, ruefully, as they told the tale at the house, I begin to wish I was safely out of this. And I don't just know how I'm going to get out. Colonel Trevilian is going tomorrow to Kansas City, said the doctor. Perhaps. Why couldn't he go in the Rockaway? cried Sally. And Virginia could go along for protection. I wonder if the Colonel would dare to take me, Gordon said. Of course he would, returned his father. And so the matter rested. It wouldn't be so bad after all, Gordon thought. At the breakfast table, Sally said, Gordon, did they tell you how Uncle Reuben saved the Rockaway? No, they told me about Mammy and the meat. Well, Uncle Reuben was about as smart as Mammy. He took off a wheel and hid it, and nobody knew where it was, and old Tigerman couldn't take it off on three wheels, and so they have it still. Good for Uncle Reuben. I suppose if it hadn't been for him, Mrs. Tigerman and the cubs would have been riding in it today. And the raid kept them busy during the meal. That morning Virginia had to go down to Mrs. Tobe Taggart's on an errand. Mrs. Taggart was a weaver and Mrs. Trevilian wanted a rag carpet woven. She had had it in mind for some time to have one woven for Mammy's house, but the raid had changed things. The dining-room carpet was presumably being put down in Kansas this morning, and the lady of the house and Mammy and Miss Nanny were busy dyeing and cutting and sewing rags to replace it. The affairs of the household must go on in spite of war, sometimes because of it. Virginia was in something of a hurry this morning, having in mind the meeting at the grapevine tree, and was rather reluctant to undertake the errand. She had herself an undutiful feeling that they had lost a good deal of time last night. Having finished her business conference with Mrs. Taggart, she started toward the blocks where she had left her horse. She looked round her curiously as she went down the steps, into the unfloored passageway between the two rooms that comprised the house. She had heard of that passageway from Miss Nanny. It was open in front, and in it was stored everything that did not have a definite place elsewhere. Saddles, riding skirts, bags of grain, and sacks of wool, the grindstone where it would be handy, and the big wheel just now not in use. From the joists hung strings of red peppers and dried okra, hanks of warp, and flapping garments waiting for their sacrifice. Great bags of carpet rags and balls proclaimed the nature of Mrs. Taggart's calling. Virginia smiled to herself, recalling Miss Nanny's succinct account of the place the first time she ever saw it. "'Sister Betty,' she had exclaimed hysterically and with cumulative emphasis, 
I tell you there is everything on the face of God's earth in that passage but the mare and colt. Renée went out with her to the horse plots. It was no unusual thing to do, but the girl was so silent about it that it did not seem a simple act of politeness. She hardly seemed to notice what Virginia was saying about the chickens in the yard. She led the horse up to the blocks, and, as Virginia thanked her and was gathering up the reins, she stopped her with a gesture. "'There's something I want to say to you,' she said. "'Wait till Ma goes in.' She stooped to tug at the girth. When she raised her head, Mrs. Taggart had gone into the house. "'What is it, Renée?' Virginia said, in a low tone. She was startled at the girl's manner. "'It's about Gordon Lay,' she said. He's home, I see. Virginia started. She did not think that any living soul knew of Gordon's coming but his own family and hers. They had taken precautions to keep it even from the Negroes. But Renée, with her hand on the pommel of the saddle, was looking straight into her face and asserting it as if she knew. "'What makes you think so?' she asked. "'I don't think so,' said Renée, bluntly. "'I know so. I saw him. "'Where in the world did you see him?' asked Virginia, thrown off her guard. "'Down at old man Chandler's last night, talking to Lois. "'It's about that I wanted to speak to you.' "'About his talking to Lois Chandler?' exclaimed Virginia, with a flash of anger. "'No,' said Renée, "'about his being down there. "'Let me tell you something. "'This ain't no safe place for Gordon Lay. "'These woods are too full of bushwhackers.' "'I think you must have been mistaken about its being Gordon.' Virginia said incredulously. "'I ain't mistaken,' Renée replied quietly. "'I know Gordon Lay when I see him, and I saw him last night.' "'But, Renée,' persisted Virginia. She felt sure she could trust the girl. "'He was at our house last night. You couldn't have seen him at the Chandler's.' "'I tell you I did,' said Renée impatiently. It seemed to her that Virginia was more concerned trying to prove that Gordon was not at the Chandler's than in finding out about his danger." I had been down past there hunting a cow. I saw him just as plain as I see you. It wasn't real dark. Gordon and Lois was standing out by the lilac bush, and he was talking to her, and she was crying. I don't know what she was crying about. Maybe her pa was sick. But you tell him what I say. There's danger for him down here. I know what I'm talking about. She glanced cautiously around her, and then came closer to Virginia speaking in a low, tense tone. "'There's men around here would as soon kill Gordon Lay as to stick a hog. I've heard him talk.' Reeny called Mrs. Taggart from the passageway. "'You'll take cold out there without any bonnet on.' "'Go on,' said Renée, releasing her hold of the pommel. "'And you tell him what I say.' As she rode away, Virginia's soul was in a tumult. What was the danger that threatened Gordon? Who was it that was seeking his life? And then, her first thrill of fear over, came other questions no less agitating. Was this thing true? Had Gordon gone to Lois Chandler before he had come to her? And that after all these months of separation? It couldn't be. She would not believe it. It was false. She gave her horse a cut with her whip, and then reined him in suddenly. She did not want to get home too quickly. She must give herself time to think. Renée must be mistaken. Of course she was. And all the time she felt in her inmost soul, the one that tells us things and will not take them back, and cannot be silenced by argument, that Renée was not mistaken. She might mistake some other man, but not Gordon. Virginia remembered his lateness in coming last night. And this was the reason. First of all, he had gone to Lois Chandler. Anger was getting the better of her. Then she reined herself in as suddenly as she had reined her horse. How absurd for her to feel that way. Of course, if Gordon had gone, and she almost admitted now in her own mind that he had, he undoubtedly had some good reason for doing so. Probably, as Renée had suggested, Mr. Chandler might be sick, and Gordon had gone over with some message or something from his father. She felt the flimsiness of this explanation before it was formulated. Dr. Lay would never let Gordon take a risk like that. But maybe Dr. Lay was sick, too, and couldn't go with the medicine. 
and Gordon had insisted upon taking it, as of course he would, and then had waited till nearly dark so as to lessen the danger. Then Lois might have come out to the door with him, so as not to disturb her father, and have been anxious and nervous, and it would have been the most natural thing in the world for her to have cried a little when Gordon sympathized with her, as of course he would. She drew a breath of relief at this, feeling that she had been sensible enough at last to see a perfectly natural, reasonable explanation of it all. But why hadn't he said something about it last night when she asked him why he was so late? She reined her horse into a walk then, and tried to recall exactly what Rene had said about it all. It hadn't seemed strange to Rene that he was down at the Chandler's. Perhaps she had seen him there before. What Rene had thought of was Gordon's danger. At that she quickened her horse's pace. She was beginning to think of this herself. Gordon might even now be down at the grapevine tree, and the woods full of bushwhackers. She would think no more of this silly thing, she said, with her lips set firmly together. Of all things in the world, a jealous, suspicious woman was the worst. He had probably forgotten to say anything about it last night, and no wonder with so many things to talk about and think of. Anyway, she knew it was all right, for Gordon was all right. Now! And her lips were firmer than before. When she got to the house, they told her that Gordon had been there and had gone down to the grapevine tree. Virginia could hardly deliver Mrs. Taggart's message in her haste to be gone. There was no telling what might happen to him down there in the woods. But when she reached the old trysting place, and he came to meet her with outstretched arms and folded her to his heart, she forgot Renée's warning and all else in the joy of being with him again. They had been separated so long, and the months had been such weary ones. When she remembered her fears and told him of them, he drew her to him and kissed her and smiled down into her eyes, and said he would rather risk the bushwhackers than the family. He couldn't have a word with her there. They would make sure of this morning anyway. And listening to his tender words, she was beguiled out of her other fears, too, and felt ashamed as she recalled them. With her hand in his and looking up into the honest eyes that had never turned away from hers in all these years, those fears seemed base and ignoble. As they sat there talking the hours away, lost to danger and the world, they heard a sudden crackling sound behind them as of a cautious step. Virginia sat upright, and Gordon grasped his revolver and leveled it in the direction of the sound. It was a moment of suspense, but following the step came another, and then a grunt, and a strolling pig stepped into view. The laugh that rang out startled him as much as he had startled them and he stood not on the order of his going. But the incident, trivial as it was, brought to Virginia's mind a fresh remembrance of Renée's warning, and she would not stay longer. When they reached the house, there was a fire in the parlor, and the sofa drawn up before it. "'Gordon,' Miss Nanny said regretfully, "'we will have to leave you to Virginia this morning. Sister Betty and I are busy with our dying. You won't be disturbed. I have locked the front door, and drawn down the blinds if anybody should be prying around. Virginia, you treat Gordon well. He is the only decent Federal I know of. And with this parting shot she was gone. The memory of that day stayed long with Gordon Lay. He carried it with him to southern battlefields. He thought fondly of it as he sat beside the smoldering campfire. He dreamed of it in his lonely midnight hours. He lived it over in a bewildered way years afterward, recalling every word, every look, every motion of the woman he loved, and trying vainly to recall his own. At dinner it was Mammy that waited on the table. Mammy could be trusted with any secret, and it was well to be on the safe side. Colonel Trevilian had been going around the neighborhood that day, looking after claims that were to be presented to the commanding officer at Kansas City tomorrow. Gordon was easily persuaded to stay to supper, that he might see him. Again and again through that day Virginia thought of what Renée had told her. Again and again it was on her lips to ask him frankly what it meant. And each time she would think, I will not. It will seem as if I doubt him. I will not bring up anything 
anything to mar this day. Before he left, they had arranged for the trip in the morning. It was raining now, and the probabilities were that the day would be bad. But it would be all the better, Colonel Trevilian said, for their plans. They would be less likely to meet anybody on the road. And besides, that would be a good reason for putting the curtains down. I will have Reuben drive, he said, and I will sit in front with him. Together we will make a pretty good screen. On the back seat, Gordon, and with the curtains down, you will be pretty well protected from view. Gordon thought with grateful heart of that long ride with Virginia beside him. It would take nearly all day. He had resisted the maddening desire to stay with her through the evening, remembering his mother. And so, buoyed up by the thought of the morrow, he said goodbye. When Virginia Trevilian knelt that night by her white bed and lifted up her virgin prayer, this was the burden of it. Oh, God, keep him, keep him, keep him, and make me worthy of him. He is true. I know it. End of chapter 24 Recording by Brian Keenan Chapter 25 of Order Number 11. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brian Keenan. Order Number 11 by Caroline Abbott Stanley. Chapter 25 A Dark Night's Ride. That night, while Gordon lay on his bed, dreaming waking dreams of another day of bliss, and Virginia Trevilian was sending up fervent prayers for his safety. A strange company was gathering in Tobe Taggart's big room, which, by the way, was no larger than the rest of the rooms in the modest log house, but was so designated because it was the state apartment, reserved for guests. In that hospitable section even the lowliest home had its place for guests. Many other things were lacking, but never this. On the south side of the passageway which had so excited Miss Nanny's mirth was the family room, with the children in the loft. On the north side was the big room, its two high, rounded beds suggesting the plucking of generations of geese, and gorgeous just now in rising sun quilts and diminutive pillows edged with crocheted lace. At the windows were paper shades, with gay ladies and gentlemen on them, and tonight the shades were closely drawn. Above this room was Renée's bedchamber in the roof, reached by a ladder. One looking at the house from the front would never have guessed that there was a second story, but its presence was attested by a small window in each gable. There were no windows below them, the gable ends of that house being mainly occupied in taking care of the immense fireplaces and the scarcely less immense outside stone chimneys that led therefrom. Renée and her young sister had, by invitation, ascended their ladder early, so as to be out of the way of the guests. "'They'll be gone before you want to get up,' Mr. Taggart had said, when she had complained of this apparent caging of herself and Lizy Ann. There was a note of significance in his words that did not escape Renée's attention, but she was not much accustomed to questioning her father, and lighted her candle with no more words. Lizy Ann's breathing was giving evidence of sleep when the men entered the room below. A considerable time had elapsed, long enough, in fact, for René to take out the lower sash and hang an old quilt in front of the window after the child was asleep. She could hardly have told why she did it, but that something was on foot she knew. She had seen the men talking around the woodpile, and she wanted an exit. She had let down the trap-door, which gave the two rooms a decent appearance of privacy, but there was a big crack in the door, widening at one end, and a knot-hole. Renée's eye was over this hole. There were three of the men besides her father, all heavily armed with revolvers, though they carried neither guns nor sabers. One had a bowie knife in his belt. They were shaggy and ill-kempt, and had the look of men who were hunted and hunting, for they kept their revolvers close at hand, and drew them sometimes at an unexpected noise. Once, when a rose-bush scraped against the window-pane, 
every man cocked his pistol and stood ready, looking a little sheepish when the cause of the noise was ascertained. Rene, from her point of observation above, surveyed this company with interest. She knew these men. One of them was Hank Menefee, who had turned corners so furiously at the barbecue. That was his way of doing things. Hank had just come. He had not been with them when she had seen them at the woodpile. "'Jeff Lows, we'd better not all go to sleep at one time,' suggested Hank Menefee, when they began to lounge on the beds. "'Shucks,' responded Mr. Taggart, contemptuously. "'Old Tig is unchained, and I reckon he's got better years than any one of you.' "'Yes, and he knows more,' added Dick Renfrew, who was young. "'Oh, shut up, Dick. This ain't no time for puns.' "'I reckon Dick would pun, or try to, if it was the judgment day,' said Mr. Taggart. "'I've known men killed for less than a pun like that one. "'But people that pun just naturally has to get em in, good or bad.' "'I reckon you'll see one killed tonight for less,' answered the one called Dick. "'I don't quite stomach that job myself.' The man that had said nothing turned sharply upon him. "'Well, stay at home, then,' he said gruffly. "'We don't want no backing out.' "'Shucks,' said Tobe Taggart, soothingly. "'Nobody ever knowed of Dick Renfrew's backing out of anything. "'He's game, ain't you, Dick?' "'I ain't a-backin' out,' said Dick, "'and Jeff knows it. "'But I tell you, I don't like this thing of killin' for nothing. "'Nothing? "'You call it nothing for a man's house to be burnt over his head, "'and his stock run off, and... "'Well, he ain't done it. "'His side done it. "'Look here, boys,' remarked Tobe, authoritatively. Quit your quarrelin' and go to sleep. If we get off at two o'clock— The girl at the knot-hole, with senses strained to the utmost, started. We! Was he in it, too? The gruff man looked apprehensively up at the trap-door. The eye was not there now, but an ear was pressed close to the knot-hole. Who's up there? he asked suspiciously. Nobody but my two gals, returned Tobe Taggart, with warmth. If you are so all a fired skeery, Jeff Dykus, maybe you better go somewheres else for your meetin' place. There ain't no spies around here, I can tell you that. It was the gruff man's turn now to play pacificator, and when this was done to the satisfaction of all, Tobe withdrew. There was not much said after he was gone, but the girl who was playing eavesdropper was quick witted, and she knew the gang. A man was to be killed, that much was sure, and killed for nothing. Dick had said for revenge. That meant he was on the Union side. Who was the man? She could only conjecture. She was getting weary of her cramped position and the small returns it was bringing her, when Dick spoke again. Say, Jeff, you can shoot the boy if you want to. He's fighting on the other side. But darned if I'll see the old doctor harmed. He took me through a spell of pneumonia last winter. Renee sat up. It was Gordon Lay. She crept into bed then, and lay with wide-open eyes staring up at the roof. And her father was in it, too. As she lay there, her mind alert and active as her senses had been when she was on the trap-door, a fierce anger surged within her. They shouldn't do this thing. What right had they to take Gordon Lay's life? He hadn't harmed them. No, nor would he, even if he had the chance. She raised herself cautiously on one elbow then, and listened. She could hear the heavy breathing of the three men. They had learned to catch sleep when they could. There was never any telling when it would be over. She sat at the side of the bed in the darkness, thinking out a plan. She must perfect every detail before she made a move. She couldn't light the candle. Where were her shoes? She felt along stealthily for them. Ah, here they were. She put them inside the waist of her calico dress. Fortunately, she had not removed her clothes. She reached for a shawl that lay across the bed. Why hadn't she pulled up the ladder? A sheet would not be long enough to reach the ground after it was tied securely. She had jumped from greater heights, but she knew the splash on the wet ground beneath would betray her. She had never stirred from her place. It was her mind only that was groping around the loft for something that would let her down. That was all she cared for, only to get out and on her mare, Kit. 
It was raining hard. The night was starless and dark, save for an occasional flash of lightning. But she cared not for that. If she could only get down. Her mind traveled around the loft, taking in the things stowed away under the edge of the roof. It traveled slowly, for there were many obstructions. Finally it struck. A thrill passed through her. She would never say again there wasn't any such thing as providence, as she had said the other day to Grandma Tolls. It struck the old bed cord that had been replaced by a new one. She found it definitely with her brain before she moved. Then she went noiselessly across the room to where it was. Her hand closed upon it exactly where she thought it would be. She had even calculated the distance. The human mind has room to stow away a good deal of rubbish and find it again, if one will only give thought sufficiently concentrated to the matter. She unrolled it, matched ends, and tied knots a foot and a half apart all the way down. Then she fastened it to the bedpost and made her way to the window, thanking God with a fervor new to her, for Rene was not very religious, that she had taken out the window. They would certainly have heard her if she had had to do that now. In two minutes she had gone down that rope like a cat, stopping near the bottom to say softly, Tig! Tig! The dog licked her hand. In two minutes more she was saying soothing things to Kit, who whinnied low. The saddle was in the passageway, but Rene was not dependent upon saddles. She found a bridle by feeling for it, and was off. It was three good miles to Dr. Lay's over summer roads. They were doubled in March, when each step was as far down as forward. She went slowly at first, startled, every time Kit's foot came out of the mud, for fear the sound would be heard, faster when the distance grew, and then at a mad gallop when she struck the prairie road. She was barebacked and astride. A bonnet was not within reach, and she had tied on an old hat of her father's that her hand chanced to touch. The storm that had been threatening all evening was upon them, but she was glad of it. Nobody else would be likely to be out. The lightning flashes showed her that Kit knew the road. The creek was up. There had been a thaw that had set all the brooklets running, and the rain had been steady for hours. She was not quite sure of the ford, but Kit would know. She gathered up her skirts, spoke soothingly to the mare, and plunged in. And Kit missed the ford. There was an agonizing five minutes for Renée Taggart then. The mare, finding her footing gone, plunged, snorted, and began to swim. Renée dug her heels into Kit's sides and clung to her neck with the grip of despair. The current took them down the stream, but the brave animal's feet touched a bank at last, and up she plunged. After that it was easy. There were no more streams to cross. It was dark at Dr. Lay's when the girl stopped before the door and sent out a ringing, Hello! It was the ordinary call at a doctor's house, and it was a woman's voice, but Mrs. Lay, not the doctor, answered it from the window. They took no unnecessary chances in those days. Who is it? It's me, Rene Taggart. Oh, did you want the doctor, Rene? Is anybody sick? No, but... Get off and come in, child. I'll be down in a minute. When she got in, they were all there, even Sally shivering over the balusters. Gordon took her by the hand. What is it, Rene? They are after you, she said simply. I came to tell you. After me? Who? The men. Quantrell's men. What have I done? Nothing. They are going to kill you for what Jennison's done, I reckon. She told of the plot she had heard leaving out her father and Hank Menefee, and, indeed, giving no names. They were Quantrell's men. That was all she would say. The circumstantial exactness of her report left them no reason to doubt its accuracy. "'I am sure I don't know what I can do,' said Gordon. "'Every horse on the place has been taken. Mine with them. Fortunately, they did not know I was here, or they would have got me then. "'Maybe you could get one from Colonel Trevilian.' called Sally from the stairs. "'You haven't got time for that,' cried Renée. "'I tell you they'll be here before you get off, if you don't hurry. Take Kit. Your horse? What will you do?' "'Oh, I'll get home some way. Go on. 
Take Kit and go. When you get to Kansas City, turn her loose. She'll come back. Oh, hurry, hurry. Suppose somebody should take her up? If anybody can catch her, they are welcome to, she said proudly. Rene, if your father finds out that you have done this, what will he do? I don't know. Her lips grew white, but her eyes blazed. I don't care. Take Kit and go. I'll take you home first, he said. It's a good long time till two o'clock. If you'll get me across the creek, she said, the horror of that crossing stiffening her tongue, I won't mind the rest. I know a shortcut. Goodbyes were said quickly in those days. It was a straining embrace and a God bless you, and he was gone. She rode behind him, her arms around his waist. Hold tight, Rene, he said. There's no time to lose. It recalled Virginia and their ride after her girth broke. It was what he had said to her. He might never see her again. They crossed the creek in safety. He took her to the pasture fence. Then she slipped down from her seat, and he stood beside her. He threw the bridle over his arm and took her hands. Rene, you have saved my life. God bless you. He held her cheeks between his hands, her cold, wet cheeks, and kissed her on the lips. Then he was gone. Rene Taggart walked home in a dream. She could feel the touch of his lips yet. It was raining, but she did not know it. She stepped into puddles, and the water gurgled in her shoes, but she did not feel it. She touched her lips once with the tips of her fingers to see if they were the same. The next morning Mrs. Taggart went early to Renee's room. The bed cord, with all its knots untied, was rolled up and tucked away under the roof. The wet quilt was under the bed. Renee's dress hung before the window. Did you hear anybody prowling around here last night? Mrs. Taggart stood beside her daughter's bed. No. Renee's heart was beating like a trip hammer. Well, Kit's missing this morning. Must have got loose, I reckon, in the night. The ice was so thin that Renee did not dare to risk a step. Her mother turned from the bed to the garment hanging in front of the window. Why, Renee Taggart, what's the matter with your dress? It's as wet as sop. It is? I left it in front of the window, and I reckon it got rained on. It was a powerful beaten rain. Mrs. Taggart looked at her sharply. She was putting two and two together. Humph, she said didactically to her offspring. Don't ever be a bigger fool than you have to, Renee. End of chapter 25 Recording by Brian Keenan Chapter 26 of Order Number 11. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. Order Number 11 by Carolyn Abbott Stanley. Chapter 26 David. Rainey's good mare saved the day for Gordon Lay. Within twenty four hours, he was on his way south with his regiment to join Grant, and in much less time, Kit was whinnying at Toby Taggart's ramshackle barn. The Trevelyans heard the whole story from Sally, who came over before breakfast to tell it. Rainey's midnight ride and Gordon's escape, the terror of that waiting, and the coming of the men at last, of their rage at finding gordon gone and how they had searched every cranny of the house for him and at last gone off threatening vengeance upon the whole family because he couldn't be found i actually believe they would have killed uncle lay she concluded if it hadn't been for dick renfrew it was a thrilling tale as sally told it and she had a breathless audience in the chorus of rejoicings raised at gordon's escape there was just one minor chord and that was sounding so deep in a girl's heart that it was not heard the rockaway trip would not now be necessary and straightway virginia began to think of the many 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 things 
she had meant to talk about with gordon that day among them was rainy's warning of the day before she had made up her mind to tell him that in a casual way and then if he chose to explain he could do so if not well he would know that she knew about it now that opportunity was gone the day was a long one to virginia trevelyan in the afternoon she went out to toby taggart's making the carpet an excuse she hoped to have a word with rainy again at the blocks but when she got there poor rainy was in bed in the family room with a cold and a high fever there seemed no chance of private talk at all and virginia was feeling desperately disappointed but when mrs taggart stepped into the passageway for the steel yards rainy whispered kit's back she knew that virginia had heard the story before this mrs taggart was back before she could answer but a quick gleam of intelligence had passed between the two girls it was furnishing the second chapter of the story they had heard good news from gordon and about him in the months and months that had passed since then he was still with grant the twenty-fifth missouri had done valiant service at pittsburgh landing he had been made a lieutenant after that before corinth it had shown its ability to work as well as fight for the flag on the battlefield and in the fever-laden swamps gordon had borne a charmed life he hoped they might soon be sent to missouri he wrote there had been talk of the regiments being ordered back to recruit but he did not know when only once had he been home since that night when he rode through the darkness and the storm on rainy's horse danger on every side and certain death behind and then virginia had not seen him he came as he thought to his father's deathbed it was on christmas morning down in mississippi that the message had reached him which brought him home come at once it said if you would see your father alive he got a furlough and travelled night and day when he got there the crisis was past and with his father on the road to recovery he might have had a pleasant visit after all had it not been for his disappointment about virginia she had gone down to lexington to visit liddy merriweather for a few weeks and dr lay's attack had been so sudden and violent that the telegram gordon's reply and his coming had all taken place without her knowing a word of it he wrote to her at once and waited till the last minute but his furlough was short and the distance long and his return was imperative when she reached home after receiving his delayed letter he was on his way south and she turned the face of her soul to the wall it seemed to her that she could not bear it poor child she was taking first readings in a lesson we all learn by heart after a while that we can bear a good many things in this world simply because there is nothing else we can do she took gordon's letter which sally had brought her and cried herself to sleep over its burden of love and disappointment he could not tell he said when he would be back not till the war was over perhaps miss virginia said mammy the next morning as she made up the bed don't you think it was powerful resky of marse gordon to go walkin round day woods whilst he was here there were no secrets from mammy he didn't said virginia sally says he hardly went out of the house he didn't even come over here he was down in de woods mammy returned reuben seed him it couldn't have been gordon insisted virginia incredulously uncle reuben probably mistook somebody else for him Humph! 
replied Mammy, with that implicit faith in her spouse's statements that all good and unsophisticated wives have. I reckon Reuben knows Mars Gordon, Miss Virginia, and de Chandler girl, too. The Chandler girl? Virginia turned from her bureau to look at Mammy. Yes'm. Him and her was standin' down in de grove. When Reuben seed him, dat grove dar in de doctor's pasture, Reuben say she was cryin' and looked like Mars Gordon was trying to pacify her. Virginia turned to the bureau, taking pins out of the cushion and sticking them in again. Lois Chandler crying, and Gordon trying to pacify her? Sally had told her that he had not been out of the house. Evidently, this was some meeting that Sally knew nothing about. Now, anybody else could have seed em jazz same as Reuben, pursued Mammy, in an expostulatory manner, and ef it had been one er dat sny gang, he'd have been gone up to spout. Yasm, he would so. What was Lois crying about? asked Virginia abruptly. I don't know him. Maybe it was bout her daddy. He's mighty bad, off dis fall, old man Chandler has. But I don't know him. Reuben couldn't hear nothing but just one time. Den he say she kind of wrung her hands and cried out and say, It's too late now, it's too late. He couldn't hear what Mars Gordon say. He talked so low. But look like he was trying to pacify her. Reuben, he low, she meant it was too late for her to be going home by herself. But I don't reckon a girl would take on so about that. Don't seem so. She was probably talking to him about her father, said Virginia, with rather ostentatious unconcern. Gordon is very sympathetic when anybody is in trouble. Yes, m he is so, Mars Gordon is, assented Mammy. And he's foolhardy, too, she added under her breath. At the dinner table that day, Virginia remarked, incidentally, Mammy says old man Chandler has been quite poorly. Have you heard anything about it, mother? Yes, I was over at Dr. Lay's last week when Lois came over for medicine for him. She seemed quite unhappy about him. I really felt sorry for the child. It was the very day before Gordon went away. It was too bad, Verge, about your missing Gordon, said Miss Nanny. Virginia helped herself to a biscuit. It seemed as if a band that had been tightening around her heart had suddenly been loosed yes she said brightly so brightly that it had almost the appearance of indifference it is too bad but he'll come again i reckon miss nanny looked at her a moment and then went on with her dinner i don't more than half believe she does care she thought i was sure last night she did that night Virginia wrote Gordon a long, long letter full of love and regret. About a week after this, Mammy came to her one day with a folded paper in her hand. Miss Virginia, she said, here's a letter, or something Reuben told me to give you. He went over to de doctor's this morning to take him some sausage meat and spare ribs, and he found this here paper down dar in de grove where mars gordon and dat chandler girl was talking dat day reuben he low maybe it's somepin dat'll git mars gordon in trouble ef it falls in de wrong hands some war paper or somepin and he say dilsey you take dat to miss virginia so here it is virginia took the paper and unfolded it feeling quite justified in doing so it seemed a sort of emergency of war as she read it the blood faded from her cheeks though her heart was pumping hard it was a note from gordon to lois chandler it had been pulled from her pocket probably with her handkerchief 
and left unnoticed on the ground it said dear lois i must see you once more and yet i have been warned not to go down to your house again can't you make some excuse to come up to my father's this evening just before night then i can see you down in the grove gordon mammy had been watching virginia with alarm startled at the whiteness of her face is it all right honey she asked anxiously would it a got him into trouble ef it hadn't fell into yo hands yes said virginia with an ironical curtness that was lost upon her auditor but it has fallen into just the right hands she slipped the note into her bosom not because she wanted it there but because she did not wish anybody to see it then cautioning mammy to say nothing about it to anybody she went to her own room she took the note out and spread it open before her a fierce anger possessed her her color had come back now and her lips were tight a sure sign with virginia that a conflict was on he must see her it was urgent she thought scornfully most urgent once more that implied that he had seen her before this was only one of many times perhaps that they had met in the woods perhaps they had even met sometimes at the grapevine tree and her lips were tighter than ever then she had spent hours of these autumn days down there dreaming of him some excuse to come he had even concocted the plan lois couldn't be trusted apparently to think up as simple a thing as that then her tumultuous thoughts went back to what uncle reuben had heard it is too late now it is too late what did she mean and virginia's heart beat fast she was not long in this mood when her anger had spent itself gentler thoughts came and more trustful ones if not more reasonable why should she believe evil of gordon she asked herself had she ever known him to be untrue before then she stopped struck with the word she had used before did she say before that sounded as if she thought him so now and she certainly did not how could she when she had not even given him a chance to explain probably everything that seemed strange and inexplicable about it all would be made as plain as day when once she could see him and tell him all about it why there were a hundred ways of explaining things that people never thought of at first somebody might have written that note and left it where it would be picked up just to tease her or to try her she had read of such things in stories she got the note out then and looked at it it was certainly gordon's writing she had determined in that first wild burst of anger to send the note to him and demand an explanation in her softened mood she was glad so glad she had not done it it was never wise her mother had often told her to do things rashly oh no it was much better to wait but it was hard then she would go over that explanation he would come after a while and then they would sit together in the summer house and she would look into his eyes and he would hold her hand and say in his quiet way that always calmed her and made her want to rest on his strength why virginia dear it was so and so and so and it would all be as clear as day and then gordon would gather her to his arms and say she was a foolish little girl to be so troubled about it but that it had seemed strange perhaps she knew gordon would acknowledge that when she had told him all and then for these communings with doubt and trust and herself 
were generally in the night watches she would take from under her pillow the picture she had had made for her in kansas city and lay her hot cheek on the cold insensate glass and sob it's all right gordon i know it's all right but it hurts me so end of chapter twenty six recording by john brandon